So yeah, at first glance, this seems like a pretty generic vampire movie, which of course there is an audience for, but not an audience the size of what I'm sure Sony is looking for here, because this is, after all, a Marvel property. But don't worry, there's a but coming, because the more you look at this trailer, as I have for this shot-by-shot -shot breakdown, the more you can see, in, you know, Inklings are a glimmer of, of a comic book movie, which, you know, means it plugs into the larger mythology. So that's, that's pretty cool. It's got that going for it. Uh, and I think that the biggest question that comes out of that, though, is what the heck place does this movie exist in? Because it's got the Oscorp uh, Amazing Spider-Man logo. It has Michael Keaton as the Vulture from Homecoming, which is supposed to be an MCU movie. It has the a Venom reference. Uh, it has, a, 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 speaking of Venom, they clarified in the last Venom film that he was not in the MCU because he glitched, you know, he got pulled into, the, he threw the multiverses into the MCU. And then also there's, of course, that reference to Tobey Maguire's Spider-Man suit. So I think, like, basically you're in, the, you're in the universe of the multiverse of Sony wanting you to go see this movie. So they're like, just put in all the goodies. But I think the reality is, and I've seen a few of you comment on this, and that's that Sony has decided to just consolidate everything into one Sony Spider-Verse, which is one of the universes in the MCU multiverse, which is a pretty darn good idea. Although it begs the question, which one will Toby, Andrew, and perhaps Miles Morales swing into? Where will, you know, I guess it makes more sense for them all to be in the same, well, I guess you can only have one Spider-Man, but then they'll be joined by Miles and Jessica as those movies hopefully move forward. But yeah. I don't know, it's sloppy, but everybody, nobody's willing to take the time to establish and build a, a, a cinematic universe like Marvel has done. Uh, you see the same thing with DC. You know, they're just like, they're, they're, they're cutting corners. And I think audiences can tell. But at the same time, audiences, you know, we love this stuff, so uh, we're ready to have a good time, even if it doesn't totally make sense. Uh, I do think that this trailer, it's the main trailer. They probably have one more coming. As some of you have pointed out, they haven't even really established who the heck the villain is. It's Matt Smith, who's in one shot in this trailer. Uh, and I, I think that one of the biggest problems is that Daniel Espinosa, who's directing this film, I wouldn't hire Dan Daniel Espinosa to direct anything that was like, that was important to me, to be honest with you, based on his previous uh, track record. A snab of cash apparently was really good, but I don't think he's he's delivered on that since. Also, speaking of important movies, it's weird to see Sony do vampires in the Marvel adjacent universe first. I guess this is technically in the MCU now, all of it. It's just a different universe in the MCU multiverse. Uh, Disney can be like, hey, let's go to other studios and see if they want to come and, uh, you know, we, we got we got land to sell in the cinema, MCU, Marvel Cinematic Universe. But, you know, Blade is coming. And uh, I guess, Kevin, I mean, I don't know. Some of you are really into this trailer, but I don't know. I would be like, I don't want Blade to look like this, to be honest with you. I'm a little, I'm a little nervous about it. I still don't know if vampires and stuff can fit into the MCU at large. I mean, I don't know. The zombie stuff and What If worked out pretty well, so maybe it can be done. But I, I guess if the MCU is going to exist forever, it's going to have to eventually try everything. So here, uh, let's try it. All right, so we're gonna go through this trailer shot by shot. And one of the most interesting things to me that becomes apparent is that you have a character in the comics who always looks like a vampire. But of course, they want Jared Leto to look like Jared Leto as much as possible. Uh, and he, can't, he doesn't look like Jared Leto when he's at his full power. So they kind of come up with this thing where he's like hacking up a hairball and his powers kind of will just like bubble to the surface occasionally. Either, you know, sometimes out of his control or sometimes he'll summon them. Uh, but, you know, I, I think... I, would, I don't know if he ever needs to go full vampire, to be honest with you. I've never liked that character design for Morbius, and in fact, it's turned me off of the character in the comics. And since Morbius doesn't have a huge fan base, I mean, I, I would prefer if, you know, I mean, it's kind of a ripoff of The Witcher, but if, you know, he just had, you know, it was just goth Jared Leto with vampire fangs, I would prefer that. But, you know, I guess there are some cool shots where he looks a lot like a, like a bat. All right, so here we go. Morbius, new trailer. This was supposed to come out in 2020, by the way. It's two years late. All right. All right, so look, it turns to blood. So he's uh, 
doing an experiment. I did like this line. I mean, it's obvious that you need a doctor. And he's like, I am a doctor. A very rich doctor, apparently. So he has a degenerative blood disease. Get it? Blood vampires. And uh, Jared Leto, I got to say, he wears a man bun like no one else. He looks like, you know, usually if your doctor had a man bun, you'd be like, I don't know about this. But you're like, he looks like he really knows what he's doing. I think it's good to see him playing a doctor. I like it. So he's trying to help someone else. He says many people have the same disease. So he's motivated to cure it. Motivated to cure it for not just himself, but everyone who's suffering. And of course, he's a Nobel Peace Prize. He's a Nobel Prize winner, uh, probably, I'm sure, in science. And I know this, of course, from the Big Bang Theory series finale. Uh, But he's a Nobel Prize winner in the comics as well. So there he is, getting his Nobel. That's a very CGI shot of the jungle there. But I like it, though. I'll allow it. That looks very beautiful. I'm like, what's back there? Looks like a treacherous uh, fly-in with the helicopter. So he's like, we have tr- unconventional means. And I got to say, it's rough being a henchman. Because look, I'd be like, hey, Morbius, this little cage you've built for yourself to protect yourself from the bats, it only seems to hold one. I mean, I guess that's what's going to facilitate the transformation that he's about to undergo. But... He says, if anyone wants to run, you should run now. And I'm like, run to where, Dr. Morbius? Michael, that's a great name, though, Michael Morbius. Where am I supposed to run? This helicopter doesn't have any doors on it. This is not a great plan. He's like, "Uh, I'm really only concerned about myself. He says he's like a good guy, but I'm like, you didn't care about your your henchman. Uh, So also, I want to point out to you that the difference here is that Morbius, Michael Morbius, is a living vampire and not a true vampire. So this is a distinction in Marvel Comics that I think if you're going to want to follow the Blade story, you got to know. So a living vampire is basically a vampire without, you know, all of the problems. <laughs> They're still susceptible, I believe, to light and stuff like that, which is why he wears a hoodie in this trailer. Uh, so, you know, to shroud himself. Uh, and he lives in New York City and sticks to the shadows. But anyway, uh, a a true vampire is susceptible to religious and mystical threats, like a stake through the heart, silver, holy water. That's not going to bother a living vampire. So I don't know who would want to be a true vampire. That seems to be, you know, lesser. You know, a a living vampire seems like a better deal to me. But anyway, Morbius is someone who's turned himself into a vampire through science. Thank you very much. Uh, And so that's supposed to be an important distinction. So these bats are like, I smell blood. See those poor henchmen. And he gets transformed into a living vampire, a vampire with an asterisk. All right, association with Marvel. So they're like, so Tyrese <clears throat> is like, you, you were in a, a tanker that came adrift to Long Island after being gone for two months. And you attack the crew, I'm guessing, which is why he's in a prison uniform. They were like firing at that guy. He's dead anyway, though. And he's like, what happened to you? And he says, I don't know. All right, so this is important. Horizon Labs, right there, Horizon Labs. A lot of labs in comic book worlds, labs and companies. So there's Oscorp here, but also Horizon. Now, Horizon Labs was something that was invented during one of my favorite runs on Spider-Man, written by Dan Slott. He wrote that comic for years. He did a fantastic job. And he created Horizon Labs, where Peter Parker started working before he before Parker started his own company, Parker Industries. You know, a lot like Stark uh, Industries. You know, basically Peter Parker, you know, before he followed in Tony Stark's footsteps in the MCU, he did in the comics. Uh, And I really like that focus on Peter Parker as an adult. And for once in his life, he was successful instead of always struggling to make ends meet. It was a really interesting time for the character. Uh, So I highly recommend those comics. And also because that's where uh, uh, Horizon uh, Labs was born. Now, what happened here is it's uh, seven, seven lead scientists uh, work at Horizon Labs, the way it works, and they each have their own lab where they work on things that interest them. So it's like a think tank almost. And Peter Parker was one of the scientists, and so was Michael Morbius. So there's a, a precedent for it. And it makes me wonder if Jared Harris, who's listed here as uh, Morbius's mentor, but they have, not even on IMDb do they mention who he's playing, I would suspect that he's playing Max Modell, uh, which would be great casting. I think, you know, he's a pretty good match. 
And what's great about Max Modell is that he's not only the founder and head, head of Horizon Labs, but he's an LGBT character, and he's uh, married to a lawyer, Hector, in the comics, who become very close friends and business partners with uh, Peter Parker, uh, and eventually are part of Parker Industries, etc. So great characters to bring in here. Uh, and again, it's like they're just, I think they're doing maybe finally a better job of fleshing out uh, they're just going to do it of you know making all the Spider-Man stuff in this one world, which would be great. I think we would. I think that's what we all want, quite frankly. It's just we wish it was done with a little bit more finesse. So that's Horizon Labs, and there he is in his lab with his fiance, Martine Bancroft. And Martine Bancroft, by the way, in the comics, to be with Morbius forever, Michael Morbius also becomes a vampire. So uh, to keep an eye out for that transformation. They have matching hair too. So he's like, I've got some pretty neat powers. And I'm like, and they're visually interesting, thank you very much. So I like that. So he's got this, um, you know, radar, bat radar, sonar. He's got super strength. He apparently loses also the concern about breaking stuff. I'm like, can't you try practicing lifting something a little less valuable, Michael? I like the sonar stuff, though. I think that's pretty cool. He's like, what else can I do? Cue the montage of, a of learning your powers. Although nothing will be as good as when Tobey Maguire first learned about his powers. That was so well done in the first Spider-Man movie. So I don't know why, I don't know what kind of vision bats have, but you know, you can see that he's got some cool, creepy pupils. I like that. So he can see like the airwaves, which is interesting. Oh, those ears gross me out. I'm like, oh, get some, I don't, I don't know. I don't like that. I guess they're appropriate for a bat, but ugh. so. I like that. I like it again when he goes Witcher. I think that's like the level I would stick with. I think that looks pretty cool. That's very done very subtly. It actually goes with Jared Leto as a whole. I'm like, that's a good look for you, Jared. He's like, I know. So look, he. I don't know if he can fly. Can he just ride the wind like a glider bat? That would be pretty interesting. Or like a squirrel. But he seems to be riding the wind created by the subway. And he's escaping in his prison uniform. I'm not quite sure where the smoke comes from. I'll be like, why bother flying if you can turn to smoke? He's like, leave me alone. I want to have my cool montage. Now that's pretty cool. Who has bigger claws, him or Catwoman? That's pretty intense though. And then look, see, he does the little cat hairball thing. But look, he's about to eat. He's probably like, stop it. I guess he's very hungry. The subtlety of these transformations, though, is very neat. Although I was tricked with that with the Carnage stuff for Venom 2, and then they didn't really ever use it, except for what they showed in the trailers. So he's like, he's like something inside of me uh, wants to hunt and consume blood. I missed the o Oscorp logo. It's so fast. There it is. I have it in my notes here. Yeah, there it is, Oscorp. I wonder, maybe that's where Matt Smith's character will work. Maybe they don't work for the same lab. Only evil people work at Oscorp. <laughs> it's like the Slytherin of, of science labs. So he said, I want to hunt and consume and eat blood. And she's like, uh-oh. He's like, you smell delicious. So there's uh, Jared Harris, his mentor. Now this FBI agent is played by Al Madrigal, who not only is he giving off Jim Gordon vibes, but I actually remember him, he stood out in The Way Back. I thought he did a really good job in that movie opposite Ben Affleck. So uh, he's investigating, trying to catch Michael Morbius. He's like, is he friend or foe? Do I want to put up a Morbius signal on the top of FBI headquarters? Now look at this, the Daily Bugle, which isn't that supposed to be a, uh, a, a podcast or a, a web thing now, right? With J. Jonah Jameson. But it's still also a paper apparently with... Uh, very weird font for a, a headline. That's very highbrow for a tabloid like the Daily Bugle is supposed to be. But anyway, there's an escaped rhino on the loose, uh, and then it says, Zoo hoax fools us all, but is that a rhino reference? And then, of course, Black Cat, friend or foe, that's, you know, that's Black Cat. And that's interesting to see that referenced here. They've been trying to do a Black Cat, something with Black Cat for a while, but it's just never materialized. That's why there's no picture. <laughs> a tabloid like that would have a lot more pictures. Now look at this. Speaking of like not doing enough, so there's uh, Tyrese playing Simon Stroud and he's supposed to have a mechanical arm. That is the worst mechanical arm ever. That clearly is just a sleeve that Tyrese puts on before they start filming and they glue those little electrodes to the rest to his hand. 
Come on. I mean, they do a great metal arm for uh, Bucky. That's what his electronic arm looks like. It's just ridiculous. It looks like a student film electronic arm. Although I think even student films would be insulted by that at this point. So he's like, uh, so uh, Al Madrigal's FBI agent says, this is like that thing in San Francisco. Obviously Venom. There is no villains in the Sony Spider-Verse. They're all anti-heroes for the most part. And looks, he made a little bat origami. I like that Simon Stroud often wears a coat to cover up his arm. Although Bucky sometimes does that too, to be fair. There he is, the one shot of Matt Smith. Matt Smith has the worst luck in picking big franchise movies to be in. Like, wow, if Matt, if you see Matt Smith has already signed on, you should run from that movie, it looks like. Cause like, remember he was in, he was really good in it though, but he was in that Terminator movie as the embodiment of Skynet. He did a great job, but he was, it was also a bad movie. I feel bad, I like Matt Smith a lot. But anyway, he's playing a character called Lox Loxius Crown, which is another scientist who also turns into a vampire, another living vampire, but his name, his codename name is Hunger. Uh, and he's, I, I would assume, the villain of this piece. Maybe again, he works for Oscorp. So there you can see Michael Morbius has escaped prison and gotten himself a suit. Because, you know, he, you know, he's, he's a, a chic guy. I guess he hasn't gone to the hoodie yet. And then you can see there's a Spider-Man uh, art there and it's tagged murderer. But that's the Tobey Maguire version. So it's interesting. Uh, I guess that's again, coming off of uh, that he killed um, uh, Mysterio, supposedly. Uh, but again, how is this referenced in this world? It makes uh, no sense. And then here he runs into Adrian Toomes, Michael Keaton's uh, uh, vulture character. I like that he calls him Dr. Mike. That's that's very Michael Keaton and very Adrian Toomes. But again, I don't know how he, how he got here. It looks like Morbius maybe is now working with the police. He's like, I'm an anti-hero, thank you very much. You're like the only true villain in the movie besides Matt Smith. So they say, you know, again, the line between hero, and there he jumps into purple smoke. That's such a Jared Leto thing to do. Little known fact, they didn't need visual effects for that. Jared Leto actually does that. <laughs> All right, so look, so see, he seems to maybe have, is that him in there? I wonder if that's him. It's hard to tell. I'm curious as to who that might be. It could be Matt Smith. It could be anybody, you know. But it would be very Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. He's like, lock me in here, but you must let me free to, to protect you. Maybe she'll get shot and I'll have to turn her into a vampire to save her. We've seen a lot of stories like this. But he said, and he says, also, I vowed uh, to, to, I'll, I'd do anything to save a life, which I think is a nice reference to the Hippocratic Oath. He is, after all, a doctor. And so he has bullet time, but he also can turn into smoke. So we get some cool still shots there like that. That's very cool. I think it's the, the gun going off creates that light. That's pretty neat. That's gonna leave an ouchie. So Morbius can attack you, really put you through the shredder, but then make a good doctor recommendation for who can patch you up. So the line between hero and villain. Everybody loves anti-heroes and Tyrese is like, you don't kill people. That claw effect is pretty neat though. So I wonder who the nurse is running from. Is it Morbius or Hunger? Oh, the line will be broken. Oh, that little girl cried. Oh, that's very sad. Is he going to visit her? Don't turn that little girl into a vampire. He's like, don't worry, it's a living vampire. So that was a pretty cool shot. So Jared Leto. I'm sure he had a great time doing this. And so then he goes full bat. Batman does this all the time in his cave. But these are some good shots of him in full Morbius mode. Then again, that's what he looks like all the time in the comics. Now this is interesting. It's a funny gag, but it also points out that Jared Leto isn't particularly good at doing action movements. So he stops this blade. I do like this shot quite a bit though. It's very neat. And like, see, he punches this guy in the throat, but the way Jared Leto pulls back his hand, he doesn't have good fight training. It just looks too not strong enough there. It's very much like the stunt coordinator told me to do that. But then this is pretty funny. He says, who are you? And he says, I'm Venom. And he does a little, again, a quick flash of his powers because he wanted him to mostly look like Jared Leto. And then I like that he says, no, I'm kidding. I'm, I'm Dr. Michael Morbius at your serious service. I thought that was pretty good. 
I like that. He seems very much like a doctor without borders kind of a doctor who would experiment on himself and turn himself into a bat and feel that it was okay. So I think that he's well cast in that regard. Exclusively in movie theaters, in premium formats and IMAX, where movies make most of their money these days, in January. And I think this could do quite well in January. I think that it looks like a fun, that's a great month for this movie, to be honest with you. So what do you think? What do you think when you see all the different, uh, like the little Easter eggs when you, when, you know, they're very subtle, but when you, when you take them into account, what do you think of Sony creating just one Spider-Verse? Who should be the Spider-Man that rules it all? Um, I'd be happy with either one, to be honest with you. Uh, I don't think, I think Tom Holland's like, I don't, not me. I think Tom Holland wants to, of course, stick in the MCU. Although, I don't, again, it makes no sense as to how Michael Keaton's character is there and the, the Far From Home reference with the murderer. But we'll see. We'll see what Sony comes up with. Uh, but what do you think? I guess, you know, as I said in my uh, live reaction, I guess there's something to be said for doing villain origins in their own movies. Instead of, you know, like imagine if like the amazing Catwoman origin, sequ origin in Batman Returns was his own movie. But I don't know. I mean, it's I I thought that that's a good example of how that's so perfectly woven into the, the larger story. I just still don't know how I feel about doing all these villain standalone movies, especially because it means they all get turned into antiheroes. Although Morbius in the comics is an antihero, and Venom, to be fair, has also been an antihero, Agent Venom and stuff like that. But we need some villains. Somebody's got to be a villain. Who draws the short straw? Matt Smith, once again. All right, share your thoughts down below, subscribe today, and of course, as always, you can check out some more videos right now.